Hey, hi, hello, how's it going, y'all? It's your boy, Nate. I read books because reading is sexy, and if you're not reading, you're not sexy. But today, we have some movie, movie stuff to talk about. What prompted this? I just rewatched Call Me By Your Name, and I'm not as much of a mess. <laughs> I did cry, but I, I'm not as much of a mess as I was last year. Last year, I was total wreck, total wreck. This time around, not too bad. Uh, mature. Huh. But yeah, I thought, you know what? I read books in a month. I also watch movies in a month. Why not talk about some of the movies I watched in June? Don't freak out, but I watched 41 movies in June. Ah! I've just, yeah, I was just irresponsible for June, y'all. And I just didn't want to deal with real life stuff. So I'm not going to talk about all 41 movies, but I've cherry picked 10 just for you. So here we go. Y'all ready? So if anyone didn't know, I also have a letterboxed link downstairs. I watch a bunch of movies. I just recently watched Gremlins. <laughs> I've never watched Gremlins. Finally did it. Fright Night. I've just been in like this big horror phase. Don't ask me why. But anyway, been watching a lot of like stuff from the past, way past when, uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s stuff. Most of the watches from June were like B-horror 70s, 80s stuff, and I don't know. Don't ask me why. I don't know. All right. At number 10, I want to talk about August in the Water. This is out from 1995, a Japanese film about this swimmer, and two boys are infatuated with her. And she goes to a fortune teller who tells her that one of the boys isn't a good match for her. From then, she is given an omen that something really bad is going to happen to her. And from there, it enters this like strange sci-fi climate fiction narrative that is a bit spiritual. And it goes in a direction you totally don't think it goes into, but starts off with that like, you know, coming of age, Japanese teen movie and all the feelings are there and then it like takes this really sharp turn into what is happening to the earth and our spirituality towards nature and it's done in this really soft elegant way where the camera just sits still in all the shots with nature in them and it's it's really beautiful really uh, wonderfully composed and strange um, especially in the last half of the film. Definitely recommend it for summer. At number nine, I have listed I Saw the TV Glow out from this year. And I thought, I really don't know what to make of it, but it's a film that still itches at me. It's about two young friends who connect over this old TV show. It's dealing with what nostalgia means, the aesthetics of nostalgia, how... It affects who we are growing up while also being an entirely queer film and the discomforts of the body as you grow out of it, grow into it. Like when we grow up, what is what does that mean? Do we grow into our body? Do we grow out of all of the ways in which we are young and know not the limitations of freedom? Like what is that? And I think it plays with that in terms of the queer body as well. It's so difficult to lay claim to what the queer body is, how to tell that to others, and also how to like and love other people when all the liking and loving that you've ever done was for this one thing that you obsessed over that is intangible. Uh, but the feelings feel so tangible. It's a messy film. There are so many takes that I could take with it, and one that still interests me. I gave it three and a half stars, but it's one that I, I can't stop thinking about because I think it's doing something really interesting, and I'm really excited for any work that the director puts out next because I think they have such an incredible vision um, in terms of filmmaking. I saw... What was it? 
their previous film, were all going to the World's Fair, which I felt like was the the yang, essentially, of uh, Eighth Grade by Bo Burnham, where it deals with, again, what does the body mean, but in the context of being online. A fascinating watch. Oh, also, hot take, y'all, but I do not like Justice Smith. <laughs> As an actor, there's just something so bland about his performances that I'm just like, why are you an actor? He's, I feel like, only ever good for Netflix movies. And that's it. Not even movies, but like TV shows. He's a soap opera actor. I said it. I said it. Um, but yeah, interesting film though. At number eight, I have Zabriskie Point out of 1970. This is about the Vietnam War and what are teens doing? Um, in terms of fighting against it. And then when you are so tired of fighting, what do you do? And so it's about this teenage boy and this girl who are fighting for the same cause and then end up in the desert and find freedom within themselves from the world at large by having sex in the dunes. Yeah, this is uh, by Michelangelo Antonio who I really admire because he just has this beautiful direction. Uh, the way the camera moves, what it focuses on, where it leads to, and there's just this gorgeous Italian fluidity to the way his films move in the American context. Yeah, he, he just has this incredible eye for how things transition. It's, it's a very careful eye, and everything is set up so beautifully, blocked perfectly. With that, I think he's a really great storyteller when we think of cinematography as a mechanism for storytelling, um, the camera as a narrative. But yeah, I just love how LA this is while also being so saturated with consumerist goods. And it just feels that like every film that I watch seems like a seed, <laughs> um, a kernel, of the hyper-capitalistic society that we live in and how we can never get out of it because the entirety and the structure of the world that we've created is built out of it. So I've been watching a lot of these like political films just because I, I've been thinking a lot like what's happening in Gaza is what is political action and for cinematography, what is that? What, what can film do to push people, say something, change something about the world at large. And sadly though, what I found is that not much has changed. The government still sucks. The American government still sucks. It always will suck and it will never care about its own people. It'll only care about the tax dollars of the American people and the non-American people. Okay, at number seven, I have one of those B-horror films that I talked about, The Incredible Melting Man from 1977. It's about this astronaut whose body begins to melt when he uh, is exposed to radiation during a space flight to Saturn. It becomes less of a horror film. It is definitely that, but the way that the whole film is set up, it's done not in a very cheesy way at all. Everything is so intentional and it then becomes an allegory for what America is and what it means for man. I think my written review will do it justice more. All the body horror in terms of like makeup design and uh, costuming is done brilliantly. It, it, feel, it looks so good as well. God, you just can't make films look like that anymore. So sad as um, everything's on digital, but even on like film, like film back then, oh, just like so toxic. Like the actual chemicals of film is like toxic, but it looked so good. Let's go back to being toxic, y'all. It's set in like a small town America and sort of these horrific moments happen as the melting man reaches out to random people in efforts of trying to be saved. He wants to be recognized as fellow man, but they're so terrified of him because he is so ugly. Like what happens when that ugliness is mixed with the internal and external? You, you can't be saved and it's proof of that. 
but I wrote here, as um, the score heightens in moments of terror, the score heightens, screeches across quiet small town America, only to land our monster in a spot of sympathy when there is a lack of empathy. And so he melts and melts away in incredible design and body hoarder, so intricately done that it slicks off the screen to reflect an America that relies on carelessness to let its people become less than zero. And the ending shot of it is horrific, gorgeously done as the man melts away. But I think it's also the melting of the man that is a, a portrait of the way the American dream is stripped away. When man loses sense of self, there, there is no point to living. Um, and there is no point to being in America. The American dream then is an American nightmare. Solid four stars for me, it's so well done and heartbreaking. The final act is just jarring and heartbreaking because you're dealing with this really ugly man that just wants to be seen as, as brother, as companion, as just another person on the street. At number six, I have Problemista from 2023. I thought this came out this year, but apparently it came out last year. Or maybe it was at festivals last year, but it was released in March first of this year by Julio Torres, who is an SNL writer, and I've always loved the skits that he put out. He did the Papyrus one with Ryan Gosling. Amazing. Great. And he just, I think, has like a queer keen eye on the funny functions of American society. But this was so much fun. It is so wacky and absurdist. Tilda Swinton in it is a force not to be reckoned with. She's so wild. But I think it's the best film about the US employment system from an immigrant experience and to use absurdism as genre to deal with it. Hits home, not at the same level as Everything Everywhere all at once, but as an A24 production. It's very A24 and yeah, just go out and watch it. I think it's Julio Torres, whatever he puts out now for cinema, I think it's going to be really interesting. One to look out for, Julio, love him. Also he has this sissy walk. <laughs> throughout the entire movie. I will not imitate it, but it's just so endearing and so funny. I, I just, it's such a, it's a cute little gay walk and he does it throughout the entire film. It's, it's amazing. Like, is that how he walks in real life? I wonder, I really do wonder. Okay, at number five, I did a rewatch of Eraserhead, 1977, David Lynch. I remember watching this when I was like 13 or 12 and it shook my world. I was like, what is this? This is so wild. Like what? What is going on? And amazing that it still holds up in its very strangeness, but it's about this lower middle class guy who goes over to his girlfriend's house uh, to meet the parents and just that uncomfortable feeling of meeting the people that birthed the person that you love. And with the person that they love, they have this like baby alien thing. And I don't know, still to this day, don't know what that thing is. And it bugs me. It has like always haunted me from the very age of 13. I was like, God, what is that? And is that what like birth is? Is this what children are seen as when we think of the nightmares of marriage, birth, and the progression of the human race. And it's just so oof, unsettling still to this day, but enjoyed it thoroughly. I think upon this watch, I forgot that there was dialogue in the film. For the longest time, I thought it was a silent film. And then I was so surprised when I heard human voices in the film and I was like, whoa, whoa alarming. But yeah, I, I've always loved David Lynch's films. Um, his worlds are so singular and so strange and deal with the horrors of life through dream and nightmare and uh, memory and trauma. He just has this way of making things unsettling at all costs. And I don't know how he does it. And he doesn't need fancy cameras either. Like Inland Empire, wild that that was shot in this like tiny little digicam and incredible man. At number four, I watched another Lynch film that I've been meaning to get to for a really long time. It is The Elephant Man from 1980 about a real life case of this deformed man who was trampled by an elephant and 
uh, tries to re-enter society uh, by the saving grace of Anthony Hopkins' character, a doctor who teaches him poetry, um, takes him to the theater, and cleans him up with the haircut, and just teaching him all the ways and how to be a person again. And this is such an endearing film coming from Lynch because it feels something so outside of his canon, yet still there, like you can see elements of him there. But Anthony Hopkins has such an immense control of feelings on screen. There's a moment where he sees the elephant man for the first time, and it's this still zoom in shot, and he's wide eyed, and then a, a tear falls down. I'm just like, where did that tear come from? How did he do that? Incredible actor and heartbreaking. So, so heartbreaking. I think it's one of the most emotionally compelling Lynch films out there. And yeah, more people need to see it because I feel like when we think of David Lynch, we think of the weird, the bizarre, but this is also weird and bizarre, but done almost conventionally in a way. And that's not to be said in any kind of offense. It's just very interesting that he has the capabilities to make films like this, films like what you see at, you know, the Academy Awards, but he chooses not to, and I love that for him. I, I love that he's still an artist that just does whatever the fuck he wants, and he's so good at it. At number three, I watched Seconds from 1966. It's about a man who is so unsatisfied with his life, so he goes to this service where they basically give you plastic surgery and, in addition, give you an entirely new life, a new identity, a new family, a new house, new job, new everything. With that, you realize, is it a cult? Maybe? What is this? It's about, you know, getting second chances and what happens when you fuck up your second chance? Are you allowed a third? What is man's concern when he is given a second chance? This is a rewatch for me. I watched this, I wanna say like two or three years ago, and I don't know what it was, but I just didn't see how the camera movements were really working. But this time around, it was so engrossing. Like I changed my three and a half stars to five stars for this one because of how delirious and anxiety ridden the whole experience of this film is. Just like the opening shots of this is uh, very low to the ground, held up, zoomed in on the face, just bright lights. It's a very dizzying experience, even though it's all done in black and white. Some of the great wild party scenes and just like seeing the sweat on everyone's faces. It, it's just such an intensely anxiety induced film, much like any of the any of the Safdie brothers films. Um, it's very much that, but black and white. Okay, getting down to the list here. At number two, I saw Wanda from 1970. This is done by Barbara Loden, who wrote, directed, and starred in the film. It's about an unhappy housewife who leaves her husband while also dealing with a court case. Just goes out, finds this other man, and then ends up robbing a bank? <laughs> it is wild the way that this film spirals. But there's this intense realism to the film, and I think an incredible portrait of what womanhood in rural America looked like during that time. Just the portrait that she created of the female experience then is just so brutal in its realism. Barbara did everything and starred in it, and then that was it. Like, this is her only film. She starred in like two or three other films, but like, this is it. This is her one hit wonder and really all she's known for. And it has this like raw honesty to it that I, I can't like shake off from it because um, it's so harrowing. I think the account that is based off of her real life experience of aimlessness, but also the documentary-esque style way the camera moves and follows her and captures some emotions as well. Like when I think about like creating stories, how real can I make it feel is always a question in my head. And what I mean by that is like how far within humanity am I able to convey a story like that? And she just does it so well. Ugh. Okay. Last film I'm going to talk about is Medium Cool from 1960, another political film. And this is done by Haskell Wexler, who has shot a bunch of movies um, as a cinematographer. But this is sort of the first movie he did for himself um, as a director. And sonically, visually, and the way that this film is cut is just done so interestingly. Because it's so expressive in how 
inventive it feels uh, because it is so experimental in terms of how to piece a film together. At once it feels documentary-esque, and then it does hold narrative. As a cinematographer, he's really looking at how shots move within each other, where he starts from the beginning of a shot, how he ends it, uh, where it goes, and he just has this keen eye of how the camera should move and uh, where it should go towards. And I just love that about this film. Yeah, I really don't know how this was all staged, and I need to do more research about it, but it just feels so real. It feels like a documentary capturing uh, the times because it's capturing the very sentiments, on-ground sentiments of the protests of the Vietnam War and how the general public feels about it. And yeah, there's this great cinema verite quality to it that is so expressive. What I've noticed is that political films must have great expression, and those expressions come from the way that the camera moves and the way that it focuses on subjects and the subject's voice. Wexler does an incredible job of feeling so in tune with the eye of the camera, but also the voice of the people. So I think Medium Cool, I think just visually, might end up in my canon because it's such a great inspiration to how one sees and how one sees the world, um, but also how one sees the world politically. And I don't think we think about that too much in terms of how we apply lenses and how we focus on things with these different lenses. And that was a, a cherry-picked, selected few films for you of what I watched in June. A lot of movies. If you enjoyed this, go ahead and follow my letterbox because I feel like I'm more... <laughs> I'm more graceful with my reviews. I'm just a better writer than I am a speaker, I feel like. So go ahead, follow my letterbox. I do a write-up for every single film. But yeah, if you enjoy avant-garde film, follow along. This is, this is me. I like movies. I like to watch. Literally in my film bro era. Ugh. Let me know what you watched in June that you really loved, would like to know. I've just been kind of like not wanting to see new movies because I, I don't know, there's just such a rich backlog that I feel like, I don't know, that needs more love and attention. So, doing that. All right, as always, be well, do good work, keep in touch.